About 10 years ago, is this too loud? Is this good? Okay. About 10 years ago, on the night of July 20th, 2012, a 23 year old armed man walked into a packed movie theater in Aurora, Colorado, and after throwing a tear gas grenade into the crowd, opened fire and killed. 13 and wounded 70 fellow human beings. I want to share with you an excerpt from a letter written to me by one of the victim's family members and with her permission, uh, share with you her response to the power of fine art in the face of just inexpressible grief and horror. Hello, Dow. I came home from the memorial today, curiously filled with warmth rather than sadness. It struck me that the gusty winds had greeted me before I arrived at the memorial had calmed. Ten years ago, I never thought a horrific tragedy would be the starting point for revealing a never-ending gift of comfort. On that night, I woke to the sounds of chaos blaring from the television. There had been a shooting at the movie theater a few miles from my home, and I was horrified to hear that numerous people had been killed and dozens injured. My heart dropped into the pit of my stomach when an uncle, one of the victims, spoke, and I thought to myself, how unimaginable it would be if I were in his shoes. A few hours later, I found out my pregnant cousin actually was there, and that her sweet six-year-old daughter and she and her six-year-old daughter had all been shot. And she was at that moment a hospital fighting for her life. While her daughter and unborn child had both died of their wounds. The moment I heard the news, my chest tightened, and I could not control the guttural screams that came from within. Fast forward to today. As I'm in the midst of planning events for the 10-year mark of the tragedy, sitting on Veronica and baby Mosier's stone, looking at the 13 cranes that make up the centerpiece of the memorial, I ponder how I got here with tears running down my face. I cannot grasp how such a terrible event that ruins so many lives has given me the gift of hope and light through the realization of this artwork. If it were not for the connections I have made, and the healing I have experienced and seen in others because of it, I don't know how I could make it from day to day. Thank you so much for connecting your heart to ours and creating this tangible manifestation of love. The creative process of an artwork can be likened to a continuum. Uh, a, a chain of events from start to finish, or uh, from Genesis to Revelation. Uh, the responses shared by this lady to this particular artwork she's referring to represent the revelation end of the continuum, where a piece is, is completed, it's revealed, and it begins to its life of impacting people. This stack of metal casting ingots represents the other end of the continuum, the beginning end, or the, the, the genesis end. Now, naturalistic orthodoxy would dictate that the artwork she's responding to is nothing more than this pile of metal ingots and a ton more melted down and reshaped, and that the responses she's sharing are nothing more than a series of randomly evolved chemical reactions in her brain that are giving her feelings of peace or 
or calm. But did you hear her words? You know, did you hear her words? There's something going on here that I can't quantify or analyze logically. Because her response is so out of proportion to what has gone into that artwork. Something doesn't add up. The title of the stock, The Space Between, refers to this space, this space between the, the, the genesis and the revelation of an artwork where um, innumerable and countless and mysterious uh, tr uh, transactions occur if we can just learn to see them. How is it that some metal melted and reshaped has impacted this person on such a deep level that she can actually find joy and peace in the face of unimaginable trauma? This space and the stuff that goes on in here is what fascinates and awes and confounds me because as a professional artist and as a Christian, this is, this is my walk with God. This is my provision. This is often the thorn in my side. And this space is a huge part of God's plan for growing and changing me. This is the space between. I think people tend to have a vision uh, of a sculptor working in a beautifully lit climate-controlled studio, and we're pushing some nice soft clay around at chest level and to the, some classical or jazz music, to the murmur of admirers and the clink of wine glasses. Well, to burst your bubble, the truth is, it often said, told you guys last night, it feels like everything I touch is hot or heavy or awkward or caustic. Um, in the winter, we are ecstatic if the studio is above 50 degrees, and in the summer, I often can't see for the sweat in my welding helmet. Um, I often joke that I wish I had the gift of painting because I feel the heaviest thing I would lift would be a picture frame, and the hottest thing I'd touch would be a latte. Just kidding, all you painters. Whew, deep breath, just kidding, kind of. Um, creation of fine art has been my passion and my profession for over 30 years, day in and day out. Um, and I'm still blessedly in the midst of a busy career. In short, I'm a practicing artist, probably a fairly pragmatic one. Um, so I, I, I may bring a slightly different view slant to the, to the art world, uh, but it's a view based on a career spanning 30 years and having tried to walk the walk of Jesus for over 40. Uh, I'm by no means an academic, and as you may be picking up on, I'm not a public speaker. Uh, after emigrating from Los Angeles about 20 years ago, my days are spent in uh, my studio, nestled in the rural bluegrass of northern Kentucky, where we do the hard physical and emotional work of creating and marketing sculptures of all shapes and sizes to people with as diverse histories and backgrounds as imaginable. And um, when invited to participate in this talk, I jumped at the opportunity because it is such a rare opportunity to be able to share the spiritual aspects of art uh, because that is a topic that happily combines two of my passions. God and art. Their confluence is my ground zero. As a professional artist, that's where I eat, sleep, and live every day. Now, while I talk, I'm going to cycle through some images of my work, not to impress, and please, not to distract, but to give context to the journey that I would like to share. Today, I want to share my personal journey and explore to some degree questions such as 
How can an artwork, whatever form it may take, have this innate power to impact people at such foundational levels? And what is it about the creative process that people find so universally fascinating? And in view of those types of questions, as an artist, what is my role in the process? So I was raised by two passionate amateur artists uh, who, having been raised in what I would call the heyday of the 20th century artiste myth uh, and educated there, were just idolized arts and artists. And I was taught likewise. One was a Jewish atheist. One I would call a Dutch universalist because she happily embraced absolutely every idea that came down the pike. Uh, needless to say, when I began my art career, although a professing Christian by then, I brought, I, I brought a lot of me to the picture and did not initially give any thought to God in my art, let alone, let alone the miraculous. Yet, as I matured, as a believer, as an artist, and, and as a person, I began to observe and become fascinated with the impact my art was having on people because it often seemed so out of proportion to the sum total of the parts that had gone into it. Um, it. It often felt like I was launching water balloons and watching artillery shells land. Just like our ever-growing scientific abilities are constantly revealing complex and established languages within uh, every physical system, I would postulate that as a God follower's vision can become increasingly sensitized to God's handiwork, that we will likewise see the creative process absolutely laced with languages and fingerprints that point directly to a creator being God. So in short, as God is developing in me an increased awareness of the miraculous, infusing everything around me, I am awed and humbled by the mysterious transaction and dynamic that can turn a dirty pile of metal ingots into an artwork that can affect somebody a hundred years in the future. So while it's certainly understandable in view of our culture, for most people to scoff at divine intervention in their naturalistic systems, which we would call a miracle, oddly, even in Christian circles, and in my experience to some degree, other religions acknowledge the supernatural, we often seem either uncomfortable with the idea of miracles or, even, or just simply blind to them at least in the course of our everyday lives, in the, in the mundane stuff. And while scripture is unabashedly replete with the miraculous, we often seem to relegate it to a weird Bible movie side category, which we reserve for the big stuff, a, a healing or a set of coincidental circumstances while being completely blind to the unending series of miracles needed to even <laughs> sustain our existence. I think a common reason, one common reason for this miracle blindness is similar to why, to the best of our knowledge, fish don't feel wet. I think that we're just so surrounded and immersed and engulfed in the miraculous that we have lost the ability or have not acquired the ability to see it. And I can viscerally remember when this first really hit home to me I was at an uh, artist residency in Breckenridge, Colorado, and I had a, we were at a coffee shop and overheard a lady talking to a friend and a neighbor. I wasn't, I wasn't eavesdropping. She was a loud talker, but she said, I don't believe in a God because I've never seen a miracle. Totally understandable sentiment uh, today. But I had been thinking about a lot of these issues, and 
it, so it, it land, that comet landed on fertile soil. And as I, as I thought about it, I realized that it's very, the very commonality of that statement is what struck me so powerfully. And as I thought about it further, I realized what was sitting sideways in my head, and it was this. This person was completely surrounded, enveloped, immersed, animated, controlled, and sustained by miracles on a scale absolutely unexplainable by any scientist, philosopher, doctor, or theologian, or on the planet, that her three-pound brain could conceive that idea, transmit it to, her, to her, her mouth, turn it into sound waves, project it through three feet of air to a conveniently designed and receptive eardrum diaphragm structure in her friend's head, which could turn those into electrochemical responses sent to her brain, which could then translate those into a thing she called a thought in her own head was absolutely miraculous. And let's not even, let's not even talk about the fact that her, her friend, our tables, our cappuccino, the coffee shop, the trees outside, the mountains, absolutely everything surrounding us was being kept from flying wildly off into space by some unexplainable force field we call gravity, pulling it all to the center of the Earth. And, le and let's not even mention that this is happening on a mysteriously inhabitable sphere spinning at a thousand miles per hour, hurtling through space on a precise trajectory at 67,000 miles per hour all of which we're oblivious to while confidently expounding on the non-existence of miracles over coffee. We're just like the fish who don't know we're wet. This burgeoning awareness began to open my eyes to many things, specifically to question much of what I've been taught and believed about my role as an artist, or use the newer phrase, the creative. And I became convinced that just as many of our priorities and behaviors need modification, changing when we become God followers, much of what I believed and had been taught about my role in my art needed to be unlearned as well. Growing up, I was immersed in what I'm going to call the artiste myth. And I am using artiste with an E, tongue in cheek. Uh, I was raised to view poets, artists, musicians as a breed apart. And I'm not just talking about giftedness. I'm talking about intellectually, spiritually, philosophically. I mean, seriously, think about it. If a teenager with a guitar slung over the shoulder weighs in on the thorniest issues of life. We'll stop and listen, right? And evidently the only reason we'd give credence to their opinions over the same team behind a McDonald's counter being our reverence for the, the, the creative. And this idea, you know, and, and, and this idea seems pretty universal I mean, even in many countries. Instead of national imagery on their currency, we find artists and, and musicians uh, and poets. Um, selfish and destructive life cho choices seem not only excused, accepted, and romanticized, but even expected in creatives. Like, we have a, a special license. Uh, our culture honors artists with the label of influencers, and it's pretty much one of the underlying universal goals of an artist to express themselves in, in whatever form that may take. So in a nutshell, this is kind of some of the orthodoxy of the art world that I inhabit. And as an artist, as a creative, this is very heady stuff, right? I mean, this appeals to our most basic desires for identity, for mystery, for celebrity, for 
a self-expression. And yet, as a Christian who's been called to be an artist, I sense a tension between this message, this worldview, and what I read in scripture. Because when I read scripture, I'm not seeing a lot about expressing myself or living for myself or finding myself. In fact, I don't see a lot about myself in those terms at all. But I do see a lot about dying to myself, um, about living for God, about living for others, about becoming a servant. So as a result, I gradually began to adopt the countercultural view that not only is the artiste myth not true for me, it's, it's unhealthy for me. And that rather than freeing it, it actually tends to stifle my artistic vision because in essence, it's encouraging me to insinuate myself into the creative process in a role that is not mine. And I, view, I feel that in view of my allegiance to God, there's a completely different dynamic at play in my life as it relates to my art. Let me try to explain. I had been to some degree acknowledging God's gift that allowed me to create art, but as the blindfold masking the depth and the encompassing nature of God's authority and direction in every single part of the process was gradually removed, I realized that there was a lot I, I was taking for granted or there was a lot I was taking credit for that maybe wasn't mine to begin with. I was clearly gifted with an artistic gift from the womb. I didn't do anything to acquire it. I have exercised it hard and I have honed it hard, but I was just born with it. So being a gift, it would therefore be ludicrous for me to claim ownership of that gift or allow said giftedness to creep in and make me feel any special or any, any, in any way more set apart than anybody else. Now probably because of my upbringing and uh, early indoctrination in the R.T. Smith, I didn't initially link, uh, associate, apply uh, the scriptural message to my art. It was like my art was uh, a separate category from my walk. And notice here how I, I still say my art. Um, but once I became aware of this lack of linkage between my faith and my art, it began to lead me yet again on a slightly different trajectory and to view my art in a new light. As I became more aware of the miraculous infusing the creative process, I felt led to acknowledge that my art gifting wasn't, after all, my art, but God's art. And if God's then similar to our financial resources, I'm really more of a steward of that gift, which led me to question, if it's not mine, then what is my role? And this seemed clearly answered in scripture by love God and love others. So, my art, after all, wasn't my art, but God's art, and was to be used for his glory and to serve others. So this awakening has had great repercussions in my career as an artist, as well as giving me uh, a new resiliency to suffer the slings and arrows inherent in an art career. When my primary um, artistic motivations were self-expression, uh, approbation, uh, striving for originality, the natural result was a massive focus on myself as it related to my art. And I found that while I might be creating pieces that spoke to me, that expressed me, in all my artistic self-focus, I was giving very little thought to those for whom the art was intended. I was giving very little thought to serving others. And I began to realize that as it related to my art, the viewers of my art were those others that Jesus was always referring to. I realized that my very natural focus on myself needed major balancing with a very unnatural focus on others. I needed to give their priority 
I needed to give more priority to the much harder call of putting myself in their shoes, of acknowledging their experiences, of considering their histories, likes, dislikes. Now, if you follow Jesus for any length of time, you know how hard it is to follow his command, consider others as more important than yourselves. Wow. How counterintuitive is that? I mean, especially for an artist, because we are all about expressing ourselves. We're all about sharing our, our deepest thoughts with the world. Well, I'm realizing that if God is changing me to make me more into the image of Jesus, then serving others and putting them ahead of themselves must also work its way into my profession, uh, into my art. And true to God's propensity for turning accepted norms upside down, I have found that by giving more consideration to the people who will live with my art, um, my artistic vision has actually matured and improved by leaps and bounds. To paraphrase C.S. Lewis, paraphrasing scripture, give yourself up and you will find yourself with Christ thrown in. In this case, Tao, the sculptor, Tao of the great artistic vision must die a little bit. And my voice, so desirous to talk about me, must quiet just a little bit and allow me to, to hear the voices of those for whom the work is actually intended. And incidentally, are often, most often, paying for. Um, so as mentioned, I'm very much aware that I did absolutely nothing to acquire my, my gifting. I know the work of my vision and hands can bring people's, people to tears, uh, to anger or peace in a way I cannot explain. I also know that God had a purpose for these gifts he gave me and wants me to use them. So now comes the crux of the question, what am I to use my artistic gift for? Money, provision, self-expression, ego, acceptance, conformity, the quest for originality, fame, self, self, self. Well, in view of God's commands to love God and love others, I believe I'm to use this gifting to honor, acknowledge God, and to serve others. And I also believe that God intends to use me as a kind of sculpting tool. And if true, I can to some degree step aside a bit, take a deep breath, and learn to enjoy the ride more and just let that happen. So I feel that this stepping aside, this relinquishing of territory is a way to honor God with the gift he's given me. It's also a form of worship and an expression of trust because every time I force myself to step back and let God work and serve others through my art rather than myself, I'm taking a tiny step of faith. And each tiny step of faith over the decades forms a trail leading me on a journey to experiences and destinations that God has planned for me. Offering my gift, held in open hands, back to the gift giver is often difficult. It is sometimes confusing. It is often counterintuitive, mysterious, and what I, as the creature, was made for. Okay, so it's now I'm envisioning every creative hackle in the room is raised, and we're all wanting to shout, hey, what about me? What about my self-expression? What about my value? What about my individuality? Well, I, we're all on the same page. And it's at this very point of tension that my innate desire for self-expression and God's desire to use me for his purposes, it's here that I've experienced, contrary to what I was taught, that Jesus' teaching of he who dies to himself will find himself needs to become true for me as an artist. As I learn to humble myself, God has used me more and more and given me greater and greater opportunities. As I have allowed the needs and desires of my clients to inform my work more, I have matured and produced better work and in turn actually feel more fulfilled and more competent to express myself 
and also to reach people at a deeper level. I must also add that I feel healthier emotionally when I am able to step out of and redirect the white hot spotlight and flash bulbs in my head away from myself. Now I have known many artists and I believe that the cultural message of the artist myth of self-expression and the cult of originality can often, often prove a lifelong burden, resulting in much unnecessary stress, hypersensitivity, depression, confusion, pain, and creative paralyzation. Those who have, I've known who've been able to just chill out, step out of the spotlights in their minds, appear to have grown more comfortable in their skin, more stable and more able to ride the roller coaster of being a professional artist. So the world-renowned classical guitarist, Christopher Parkening, has on his practice music stand a memo that says, why are you here, Chris? Now that is a great question for an artist to ask themselves, right? That's a great question for me to ask myself every morning when I turn on the lights in that studio. That's a great question to ask myself after I've lost my fifth competitive call for artists in a row. And that's also a great question to ask myself during the ego-stroking excitement of a dedication unveiling ceremony. So here's a recent example of stepping back and God working very graciously with me. So the single hardest part of a sculpture for me is the idea. Uh, welding, grinding, sculpting, it's hard work, but that's not that hard for me. But I can weld and grind and polish and push clay around to my heart's content. But if that original idea isn't strong, the resultant piece won't be that exceptional. I now fully realize that without God holding every cell together and putting every breath in my lungs, keeping my synapses firing, I can't exist, let alone let alone create anything from scratch. Which reminds me of a story I love of a group of scientists challenged God to a creating contest, and he agreed. And as they reached out a scoop of a handful of dirt to start, he says, no, no, no. You have to make your own dirt. And when viewed, you know, when viewed with a vision tuned to the miraculous, every idea is ultimately given to me which in essence makes me a conduit of sorts, a borrower of ideas to start with. So last year, I was commissioned to create a memorial to a client's daughter who had tragically died. And the normal sense of responsibility in that situation was heightened because I had become friends with this client and I knew her pain and I wanted the piece to be special. So I did what normally I would do. You know, I went home, started to mull it over at kind of a low key, in the back of my head, just conceptualizing it, which was all great. Nothing came. That continued for a few weeks, and so now I'm starting to feel a little frustrated, so I ramp it up, you know, and then it's, it's kind of like a creative movie. You know, I just get the paper out and the pot of coffee, and I'm sketching and bawling and sketching and bawling and sketching, which was wonderful too, nothing came. So as the level of frustration stepped up, um, I realized I need to practice what I preached a little bit, and I just kind of stepped back, prayed, decided to try to chill out. It was really, really hard. Two days later, two days later, I, in a dream, I know it sounds like a story, it's all true. In a dream, I saw an image so perfect and complete that all I did in the morning was sketch it. And the client approved it with tears in her eyes. Um, that's an example of me getting out of the way. And to quote a lyric by the great theologian, Alanis Morissette, the moment I let go of it was the moment I got more than I could handle, and the moment I jumped off of it was the moment I touched down. Now, while this was a wonderful experience, 
and a bit unique. The next part of the story is just plain weird, and I have no idea what it means, but it's so weird, and of God, I want to share it. The night before I was to um, present the idea to the client, I had prepared a concept sketch. I was laying awake, couldn't sleep, and I just had the image of violins going around my head because the image I had dreamed about was this stylized female figure playing her violin in the wind with this beautiful dress just wildly blowing around her. And it made me feel like a great piece of music feels. So like I said, I was just laying awake, and just images of violence, images of violence. In the morning I woke up, I said to my wife, I would love to read a book about the creating of the great classic violins, you know, the Stradivaria, the, the, the Amadis, all of these, and then the science behind their amazing sound that is so hard to replicate. To which she replied, that's really weird, because that's not my normal reading. <laughs> um, fast forward two hours later, after church, our pastor came to find me, which is odd, to tell me he wanted to give me a book he had just finished about the creating of the classic violins and the science behind their sound. Now again, I have no idea, I have no idea what that all means, but it's pretty startling and wonderful to be allowed a tiny glimpse of things in motion that are far deeper and more complex than we'll ever, ever be aware of. So now I wish I could roll the credits and smugly say this is how I always respond to creative log jams. And this is always how God works with me. That would be a total lie. Far more often, the idea does not come wrapped up in a little red bow. And however, I am learning that gr grudgingly that these other times, these dry times, times of frustration and rejection, have great value as well. Because these are the times I still need to learn to exercise faith. These are the times when I do brainstorm, sketch, wrestle and revise and press through the all too, creative, cre uh, all too common creative brick walls. This is when I do doubt, when I do feel frustrated, when I do feel dry. But I'm learning that it's silly of me to expect to always understand the workings of a cosmic being with a little tiny three pound brain. This is when I need to rely on the things I know about him. I know he loves me. I know he is good, though not necessary as I would just explain good at that particular moment. I know he made me artistic and I know he gave me this professional opportunity, so I just keep working away at it, praying about it, and trying to unclench my little white knuckles during the process. Because just as I am ready to happily accept the mountaintop experience of an idea being gifted me in a dream, I want to become as equally accepting of the far more common experience of some blood, sweat, and tears in birthing a concept. So, what if I had pressed through to an idea? My guess is I would have come up with an idea that would have probably been fine. My guess is the client would have approved it. But look what I would have missed out on. Maybe the idea wasn't even the point. Maybe me letting go was the point. Maybe me trusting and relating with my creator. And then maybe experiencing his gracious revelation and gifting was the point, or part of the point. Maybe sharing the story with you today was the point. I don't know. But I do know that if I'd taken a different approach, I would have missed out on a beautiful and mysterious experience with my father. So essentially, as an artist, I want to be the fish who feels wet. I want to learn to see God's fingerprints on everything around me. As an artist, I don't want art theory, artistic schools, art philosophy, debates, what's trending, to distract me from the wonder of the creative journey. Even if I've traveled it a hundred times or a thousand times, I want to see the creative process as through the eyes of a child. 
to see the wonder and to see the miracles. And I do not mean that in some Hallmark card, fuzzy land sort of way, but with a real, concrete, pragmatic, down-to-earth scientific consciousness and acknowledgement of the divine workings, which in turn places me in attitudes of reverence, worship, and gratitude far more frequently. So now, what if we revisited this little metal ingot? It's nothing very exciting. This is an ingot of 356 aluminum casting alloy. You order it from the smelter, comes delivered on a pallet, you melt it down, you pour it in a mold. And yet, if we are looking at this with eyes tuned to the divine that engulfs us and can discipline our eyes to see through what we've always taken for granted, we'll realize there is nothing remotely simple about this little piece of metal. This little piece of metal contains enough mystery to probably earn 10, 000, a million, a billion PhDs. Do you know this? This little solid metal ingot isn't actually solid at all. This little piece of solid metal is 99.999% empty space. Let me say that again, because we just close up when we hear big numbers. 99.999% empty space. Its solidity is a complete illusion to our senses. This is like Alice in Wonderland, crazy land, when you start looking into this. So I'm not a physicist. If there are any here, please don't shoot me till later. But to try to explain as best I know, the building blocks of this metal ingot are atoms. Atoms look like many solar systems. The sun is the nucleus. The surrounding orbiting uh, planets are the electron field. Now, if we could take one atom and enlarge it so that the nucleus, the sun, is four inches in diameter, how far away would those orbiting electrons be? 10 feet? 50 feet? Try four miles away with everything between them being nothing but empty space. This metal bar is no more solid than our solar system is solid. This metal bar doesn't feel, only feels solid because of ethereal and unexplainable forces holding the atoms in relationship to each other tightly and incidentally holding each atom from just flying apart. If I heat this metal bar up, those mysterious forces relax. We call that melting. As the temperature raises, after a certain point, they mysteriously reassert themselves. We call that hardening. This stuff is absolutely insane. Do you know what's really crazy? We artists will give far more thought to what beret we're going to wear to some dedication than to the miracles underlying absolutely every aspect of what we do. So it turns out there's nothing simple about this little metal ingot. There's nothing simple about this lady's response to the artwork. There's nothing simple about any act in the creative process. And if we're looking at things accurately, there's nothing simple in the entire universe. And that's, that's just a piece of raw metal at one end of the creative process. On the other end lies the finished responses to the finished artwork, like those shared in that letter. This is where I get to see the miracles when fine art collides with lives. This is when I get to see the power to heal, the power to bring closure, the power to encourage, to inspire, and yes, to anger, to disgust. This is when I get to marvel that these reshaped ingots have helped bring healing and closure and restoration to a group of people powerfully impacted by trauma and horror on an unimaginable level. The audience in that theater that night were as diverse and eclectic as you can imagine. And yet, that artwork 
has risen above their differences uh, to affect them at this universal soul level. Now I can say without reservation that the single most fulfilling moment of my career is when an artwork I have created with my vision and my hands impacts somebody in a positive way. Uh, the feelings of humility and accomplishment, of gratitude, joy and relief I experience when an inanimate piece of metal that I've shaped brings someone to tears or inexpressible. How is it that our little lump of metal, reshaped, can resonate with our deepest emotions? How can it that an image seen in a dream can bring comfort to a grieving mother? How can it be that my, the result of my hours of pushing clay around in a freezing studio can cause a 21-year-old quad marine amputee to whisper thank you to me through a lipless mouth with tears running down grafted cheeks for the veterans memorial I sculpted. How can a group of, grouping of pigments suspended in a medium on a canvas lead to centuries of contemplation and debate? How can a specific sequence of aural vibrations we call music bring somebody to tears, transport somebody to their childhood, and encourage someone else to charge into battle? I don't know. I don't think anyone can know. In light of the disparity between our tiny, created, finite brain and God's cosmic otherness, it seems silly to even think we could know. Rather like a grasshopper trying to comprehend the inner workings of a blue whale. I must remember that this cognitive spirit I call me, which is temporarily inhabiting this flesh suit I call my body, includes a tiny brain with which I attempt to make sense of this universe, physical and spiritual. When seen in this light, I am learning that I need to become more comfortable living within the tensions of mystery. Humility forces me to recognize I can only probe the edges of creation for answers. This doesn't mean, however, that I don't question, contemplate, and even try to formulate answers, nor that I also don't try to understand, and sometimes in my arrogance, sometimes judge and accuse, the unnameable, the uncreated prime mover, the cosmic I am creator being God who simply breathed all this into existence. And now, while I can't know all God's workings, having eyes that now look for God's fingerprints in these things is fundamentally changing me, my art, and my walk. In the movie The Matrix, the main character Neo is given a red pill that allows him the ability to see completely through the fake computer-generated world his senses tell him he inhabits to the true reality that's behind it. In those precious moments when I am in tune with the true reality of the universe, it's like I've swallowed a red god pill. And the scales have come from my eyes, and I'm able, for fleeting moments, to view the universe in a different way. Like a corner of this cosmic stage curtain we call reality has been lifted, reminding me that there's infinitely more behind it than in front of it. Are we, as artists, essentially sleepwalking through an Alice in Wonderland universe fixated on self and trinkets? Is our vision so distracted by this temporary visit to Earth that we're blinded to the unfathomable which engulfs us and points directly to the reality waiting behind that curtain? Do we all need to find a cache of these red pills? Are we positioning ourselves to be used by God? How can we become instruments more finely tuned and receptive to God's frequencies? Are we missing out on all we're intended for by our obliviousness to the true realities of our existence? Do we sell ourselves short? Are we settling? 
I will say, in closing, my friends, that it's not the metal in that ingot that has the power to touch a human's heart. It's not the paint, it's not the pigment in that paint tube, it's not the spruce in that Stradivarius violin. And as deflating as it is to say, I don't believe it's this animated assemblage of biological material I call Dow Blumberg. I believe these are merely divine tools or vehicles or instruments used to produce visible evidences of invisible heavenly transactions that are too mysterious, unfathomable, and perhaps, perhaps too holy for explanation. But evidences which scream his name and are completely appropriate for embracement as the holy mysteries they are. And I can now, sometimes, in a halting and blurry way, discern divine fingerprints on a dirty little metal ingot. So, thank you. Any questions, comments before we break? Thank you so much. Thank you. I thank God for you as well. Uh, I had a question, if it's too personal, don't answer it, about your prayer life. Uh, how has scripture in your prayer life um, contributed to your work and creative process or vice versa? How has your work affected your script, uh, approach to scripture in your prayer life? Okay, sit down. Everybody go get some coffee. <laughs> We're going to be here. No, kidding. Thank you. Thank you. What a wonderful question. Um, it's like hitting a, that's like hitting a moving target because it's all, that's always changing. You know, as I am not the same person I was 10 years ago, and I'm not the same person I was two weeks ago, and God is working at me. I think... My prayer life is my time to relate to Father, to, to build into that relationship, to tap into his voice. Um, but it's integral. You know, there are times where classically I'll, I'll, I'll go pray for an idea. You know, just, dear God, give me an idea. Or last week, I, you know, I lost the competition. I was like, just feels like your gut's been kicked out. It's like, dear God, I don't like this rejection. I don't like this feel. I don't want to feel this way, but you put me here. You gave me this ear. So it's this, con for me now, it's this constant back and forth. And then when I have experiences like, like an image given to me, I can, I can viscerally say thank you. And when I pray very specifically, then I, when I get to see very specific answers, that just increases my faith and my trust. So it's just this snowball relationship thing. Um, but I think for me, I need to be in prayer very constantly. We'll, we'll try to start the day in the studio. This is my assistant, Micah, by the way. We'll try to start the day in the, in the studio to prayer because it can, you know, just like anything you do, I don't care how cool it is, it starts to feel like work, right? Movie stars, rock stars, they're complaining about their jobs, you know. But we all, we're all like that, we're humans. So no matter what, a, what beautiful piece we have in that studio, there are days when we're grinding and welding, it feels like work, and I forget. I forget, and we can forget, that we're creating a piece of art to bring joy to somebody. And so it's a great time to re just re re remember that constantly. Because Con it's never one and done. It's not, oh, I've prayed a certain place, I'm at this plateau. I'm either going this way or I'm going this way, my relationship. So it's just trying, you know. And this is big words, but this is my attempt. <laughs> so thank you, great question. I'm fine with you guys yelling it out, by the way, if you want. Um, 
Uh, thank you so much for your presentation. I thank really you. appreciate your heart. And um, what I really love to see is how you see your role in relation to the people you serve, and especially like that vision you have for how it's received. Um, one thing that I think the church in general has struggled with is what to do with artists in their pews, you know? And so I was just wondering, um, I mean, you had that lovely story about your pastor handing you a book. I'm just wondering how um, you see your role as a part of uh, the local church the body church. and how your role as an artist has, has kind of influenced that. And, and, um, and it, is there something special that you offer to your local body? Yeah. Do you see? That's a great question. And I think a question that's pretty much unanswerable, you know, there's no hard answer, and I certainly don't have it. I think that's been a historic challenge, you know, especially with the way we're wired as creatives. You know, it is sometimes you don't always feel like you fit in. Um, and, and, and conversely, you know, what, do, what does the body do with artists, especially you know when they have a perception of what an artist is, and that can sometimes be like this. Um, you know, uh, I think just for me, doing what I do, uh, being a normal person, um, and being okay with being not trying to be different to be different but being okay with where I am different. Um, you know, we go to a small group and oh my gosh, I just don't feel like I fit in. Well, I don't, that's fine. They probably don't feel the same. Who can fit in? We're so individual. And, and that that's okay and that if anything I do or if I'm, the way people view me is different, like that's the, just, just chilling out, but just, just going after what God has for me trying to do good work, trying to grow, trying not to stagnate, um, just moving forward, you know, and, and doing what I can in the body. Bad answer, but, <laughs> you know. Yeah, it's a, it's a tension, and just, just being cool with that, you know, but not let, letting go of my hypersensitivity, you know, and if, if there's somebody who, I don't know, just react a certain way to something I've done or whatever, then it's okay. You know, it's a free world and that's all right. Yeah. Anybody else? Quite intrigued by many of the sculptures that I've seen projected, particularly that one of a flock of birds taking flight and each of the birds is connected to each other by their wingtips. Mm -hmm. I imagine that must have been an outrageous feat of engineering to get that structurally to hold together. I'm, I, perhaps this is a related question, perhaps it's the same question. Do you ever find that your medium frustrates your vision. intended artistic vision and uh, do you uh, have to find creative workarounds? That is a great question. Um, Yes, the birds were an engineering challenge. <laughs> but um, to the second part, yes. Um, in the times when my vision is very fruitful, there are certainly dry times, but in the time, okay, so let's, let's, let's take it back. There's a reason why my portfolio is so diverse, and that's very intentional. I don't, just don't do the same thing and just keep changing it year after year, decade after decade. And I like to, I like to try new things. I like to experiment. I like to try. You're going to see classic bronze. You're going to see abstract. You're going to see stained glass. You're going to see, you know, what you're not going to see is the failures behind the studio <laughs> that didn't work. But we're trying. And what that does is it's enabled us by, if we, if I go to a site, it allows me to come to a site with a, blank, a creative blank slate and feel the sight, feel the energy, talk to the people and allow that to inform my vision and the direction rather than my limited, my skill set. So if I go and I'm like, oh my gosh, what if there was some glass and light and, blah, blah, and I've never worked with glass or light, that's okay because we'll, we'll go figure it out and trust that God allow us 
to figure that out. And that gives me more freedom to take, to be informed by the site and the people at the site. Um, if I have, and it gives, and then it gives me more tools in my toolbox for down the road, so that I feel less frustrated by my limitations. But then to speak to your question, yes, materially, I wish there wasn't gravity. I wish, I wish there were sky cranes. I could just hold things in. So there's a ton that's frustrating just because of this, this fallen world, you know, world we live on. Does that answer your question a little bit? Okay. Anybody else? Shout it out. Yeah. Yeah. The, you know, you just, I would imagine that there's a lot of pressure to deliver, and you don't want to mess it up. So, uh, just curious. That's a great question. Robbie's question was, when I do memorials to a tragic event or something, how do you deal with that pressure and responsibility? And um, prayerfully, again, I think my number one thing is to resist what I said about making it, allowing it to just feel like a job. Okay, here's another job, they're hiring me, I gotta come up with a good idea, I have to make a good presentation. No, these people lost somebody. So taking it back to, these are human beings, and letting that be ground zero, that's the starting point, instead of, oh, I really need this job. Um, and then I think just, for me, it's just being real. Like when I sit down, letting people, being accessible, because I'm realizing that when I'm helping somebody, and we're not talking about something you're putting in front of a shopping mall. You know, we're talking about a memorial to an airplane crash where 73 people died. Making myself accessible and realizing that, not me, but the creative process that she's part of, and she was a part of it, um, is part of the healing process maybe God wants her to be involved with, and I'm involved with it. So being on the end or end of a phone call, if someone wants to just call me and tell me their story, and that's what they want to do. You know, grieving people, they want to tell you that story. And being okay, you know, not, not like tapping my fingers, but being all there. And then I find that that will, that will inform me. So when I do begin conceptualizing, it, it's going to be more authentic and real and grow out of that tragedy. And then it speaks to, it speaks to these people so, yeah, no easy answer, but it's all of that stuff. I think it's about being a human being. Being a human being, being Christ in their lives, um, you know. Anybody else? Any other? Yeah. yeah. Um, I was kind of wondering, you, you're doing a lot of commissioned work. Do you do work that you... Not you get an idea, you yeah. want to just pursue it. Yeah. Yes. And how does it work? So the question was, you know, I'm showing you a lot of these pieces are commissioned pieces. Do I ever do pieces, you know, what I call, just for myself? And yeah, you know, I, there was a time when I was, I disciplined myself, like every three commissions I would do something for me. Everybody's different. Um, <laughs> I haven't been good about that recently. But one of the, you know, one of the God things is, a lot of what I'm doing now feels like it's for me. So if I'm commissioned, but I come up with an idea, it feels like, like, like that violin lady idea, image, I'm so excited about that. I'm so excited, it, it, it's, it's a commission, but it feels like it's mine, and it's that special story, and I love the image. That's gonna be one of my favorite pieces. Um, to your point, I think it's important that I do pieces for myself. Um, then an artist can, you know, that we can, Sometimes just do, even if I know, like I also have a sculpt piece and never cast it in metal, you know. I have a piece in my studio I did in a residency just for me. Uh, I've never cast, it's just still sitting in the studio all dirty and dusty, covered with you know, clay. So that's very refreshing. And I think that's one of the points of artist residencies where they allow artists to come and create something just for themselves, gives you kind of a space. So um, it is important, I wish I did it more. <laughs> 
you do have a separate space kind of in the house where you Yeah, Michael was saying, I do have a little creative space in the house where I sometimes try to paint, which I won't show you my efforts. <laughs> We're going to quit while the quitting's good here. Yes. Anybody else? Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you. This was an amazing opportunity. Um, yeah. It was so wonderful to be able to talk about this. So, thanks.